Join us on this episode where we'll be diving into the world of enterprise solution architecture with Jonathan Teixeira, a seasoned principal engineer and enterprise solution architect. With over 20 years of experience in software development, Jonathan is passionate about building scalable, robust, and user-friendly applications that address complex problems and deliver substantial value to customers and stakeholders. Through his career, John has held significant roles across various organizations, including CIT and Guararapes, where he was instrumental in shaping sophisticated systems and leading technical teams towards innovative solutions. Whether it's enhancing system architectures or driving the adoption of cutting-edge technologies, Jonathan's work has consistently pushed the boundaries of IT and software development. Join us to gain science from his extensive experience me and understand the evolving landscape of enterprise solutions. What moment in your life defined who you are today? Telling you earlier, uh, it's not like there is a single moment that uh, defined my life, but uh, a whole story, I guess. <laughs> what defines me is uh, the hardships that we that we had on the past, like uh, before 2010, um, Brazil uh, didn't have an, um, the IT in Brazil was really weak. There, there wasn't many companies uh, working with uh, high tech. <laughs> there was uh, a few of them. We had uh, some people, there were very good people working in the fields. Uh, in the time I was, uh, I, I remember that I I used to to hear the PHPSP uh, group. That uh, I don't know if you know the guys. Probably you know Augusto Pascucci, Ivo Nascimento. Uh, Augusto has worked with us on, on the Fiji either also, but I guess uh, he came after you. Uh, but uh, at the time, we, uh, it was very hard and uh, we didn't have a child, we didn't have uh, this, this culture we have in our IT. I mean, uh, we used to, to get a lot of burnouts, uh, <laughs> there, was, there was no, no mercy uh, on us, we had to work uh, like there was a company that I used to work that um, at 10, 10 a.m. Uh, in the night that, uh, well, I see, well, I'm leaving, I, I, can't, I can't do anything anymore. And the guy can, uh, so where is your motivation? <laughs> Are you uh, motivated today? <laughs> I, no, it's 10 o'clock, I, I really need to go home. The, the last train is going to, to, to leave soon. And I want to be able to get home because I I work at like two hours two hours and a half away from my home. Uh, it was like a, a travel, so I, I was uh, five hours on on the moving from my home to, to the office. And, and that's it. That there was no jobs on my hometown. Uh, I work at um, São Paulo, but I live in São Bernardo, that is a, it's a, a, count, a, a city that's nearby São Paulo, and it, mm -hmm. was, it was very hard to get there. And I was, uh, I, I did, I done this for 10 years straight, working uh, away from my, from my home, and uh, the rentals of São Paulo is like hell, like, uh, even even though I had a good salary, I couldn't pay rent in São Paulo because it it was another level. Even because uh, the companies, the IT companies, were all in, in noble neighborhoods. That uh, even if you if you live in São Paulo, it will be very uh, away from your home because the, the places you can rent is, is far away. And most workers in Brazil uh, uh, struggle with this, this problem. But I guess this this was uh, really defined for me 
because uh, uh, yeah. it, it may seem uh, amazing, but it was the time that I I spent more time reading books because of this travel, like five hours on the movie, so I was reading mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, so I was like, uh, I was decided that I, was, I wanted to, to have a lot of certifications. I, I wanted to be the best, the best professional you could find on the market. So I took a lot of, of studies. I made a lot of, of courses. I read a lot of books and I took some uh, certifications. Uh, towards the towards the, my my goals in my career, and uh, there was no rest because I I like I was studying to to like to to in the morning, so I used to to study into to the end to do some uh, open source programming, and uh, I do a lot of releasing also because I was trying to pay for a new car and I, I wanted a new car so, so badly to go to work and you, you know that in Brazil cars are <laughs> even the most used car is like a, a fortune for you to, <laughs> to afford and, ah, it, it, and there's also this problem that I was a DJ, DJ uh, to each person and yeah, in Brazil they used to to pay us uh, like uh, we had we had to open a, a company in order to work for, the, for these people, mm -hmm. so they could save money, uh, and that's uh, it, that's not quite legal in Brazil, but uh, we do it in, anyway. And so you 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 have no working rights, you have no uh, you have no special payments or bonus or anything that. Company provide us with its laws. We out of the, we are outlaws, uh, and I didn't like this very much in the time. But I I was determined that I was going to uh, work, work, and work, learn, and become better. And then I was going to 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 work abroad, like going to work on on Europe some other country like you did but uh, I wasn't lucky enough to find something so but now I think that was better for me uh, and that's it then uh, I guess the, the, the final moments was uh, going through all this struggle and I see being an IT on a time that was very hard to be a programmer there was no Google, there was no uh, stack overflow, there was no chat GPT, nothing. And uh, I remember my first job that the guy asked me, hey, you know MVC, you know Cake, uh, PHP, you know same framework? Uh, and I, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I felt like I felt good with this. And then the guy, okay, you don't see the experience, but I'm going to give you uh, an opportunity. I had to study because I'm going to start there in the next week. And uh, I started there without knowing anything. <laughs> but uh, it worked out. I, I did it. I, I created a system for these guys on from scratch. And uh, so you can see, from that time, we, a single programmer, Use it to get a system from end to end, from beginning to end, an entire system. There was no front end developers, back end developers, DevOps, nothing like that. We, do, we did it all uh, alone. <laughs> and I guess that's the magic. That's where I really learned uh, how to work. And that's uh, what I carry into now as my school. You know? I see, I see. In your story, there's a lot of very interesting things, and uh, just just uh, moving backwards a little bit, uh, 
you mentioned that you used to live in a place, I mean, in a very big city, is one of the biggest cities worldwide, that is Sao Paulo, and Sao Paulo is, there are, you know, like three, four major cities that they call it ABC. Also, you mentioned that only commuting, going and back to work, you used to take around five hours, and uh, in that time, uh, Agile was not maturing to the companies, maybe they was not well known as well, and uh, you mentioned a lot about the overwork that you had. And uh, there's a lot of hardships that you pass by, uh, as you mentioned here, and the challenge that you take. And this is a very interesting thing because you just mentioned that there were opportunities which you didn't know much about what was happening, what was going on, and you know, you get the chance, you work that out, and things just goes fine, which is really good. It shows that you are a very talented person. And uh, moving more in this direction, you just mentioned something interesting that, uh, before, a uh, software engineer was able to take a system from scratch, from the beginning to the end. However, the complexity of things has changed, and of course, we learned and understood better things today, doing and helping others to do it. Maybe that's why we end up with DevOps and many other different roles that are essential and very important to have a working software so how you see all of these changes that happen along the way which is part of your career and also you was in there building that up actually i think the companies didn't have money back then so they didn't have money to have all these groups um, especially in brazil because uh, brazil was, was um, uh, on its big steps into the application building, right? It was like, a, it's, it was kind of new in Brazil. Uh, there was like a big companies that uh, had a lot of budgets, in it, but these companies had like um, systems do, uh, done with uh, COBOL and uh, other older technologies. And, the technology that I was approaching was, was web development, PHP, uh, HTML, JavaScript. Uh, this was pretty new in Brazil. And the companies that was uh, interested in, in doing this kind of system uh, was starting out and didn't have enough, much money. But uh, what I see is that, the, for example, this first system that I'm telling about was on, on Birch. Birch is was at the time the biggest uh, graphical material for big. Uh, I think you want to talk about. Uh, I think that's it. This printer is is how they call these companies or print on demand, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but they did it for for major uh, commercial companies, you know, like outdoors and. Uh, they did uh, some uh, advertising for for big magazines uh, and such. They had uh, this big studio where they had these uh, famous models. I, I met some some famous people there while they were shooting some commercials, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. And this is now I was designing all alone, all by myself. It was called Via Burti which is the system that was used to provide uh, all the mechanism for, for us to distribute the material to the, to the what they call the fake, the, the news fake. So we were going to, to send that advertising to, to a global magazine. Uh, global is a big company here in Brazil. Uh, so they had this, uh, uh, for us to receive this advertisement, this got to be a PDF with uh, RGB uh, uh, and all the stuff. So the system was about uh, getting the advertisement and, uh, and applying these standards for each vehicle uh, and sending to them automatically for whatever channel they had to receive it, like FTP, email, uh, any, any kind of uh, way they were. So it, 
it was a very complex system. There, there was like a, a feature that uh, had to open the PDF and do uh, grammatical corrections on this PDF. So we used uh, a lot of Linux in the background, like Latex. We used Niche Magic. Uh, we used, uh, we had to like, um, so you so you can have an idea. We had to to, to change the Samba protocol. We had to to create our own Samba to do something on the on the system on the OS from from some, uh, from the guys. Like, mm, sorry, uh, by creating the system, you mean you guys had a kind of uh, system which you could edit videos and uh, maybe images, or I, I got it wrong? Yeah, images, PDFs, uh, videos, we, we, because there is this, this, this team that used the, they, what we can call this, they, they made the fix. So there is a model who has a, a adjustments. Yeah, like uh, uh, you have uh, Adobe, right? We have yeah. companies like Adobe that have a full suite of products exactly to work with uh, multimedia, right? Yeah. Not only pictures, but also videos to make sure that they have a very good quality and also is looking good. Yeah? Yeah, and send to the companies that uh, need it. So uh, we also had to, uh, these guys who do this fix. Uh, we had a, a, a server uh, running on the Mac, on the Mac OS, uh, so that we could watch the folders. And whenever they save a new version of that uh, advertisement, the system had to hear, uh, to listen to the changes, and, and grab the file and do the adjustments and, and, and all this stuff. And we had to have this. Uh, all the hashes and, and all the history that happened with the file, so we have to to watch the file. Uh, imagine uh, a junior programmer with little knowledge have to learn about all this stuff to create a system from scratch to deliver on that. So uh, I guess it, from that point on my career to into today, I never worked with so complex system like that anymore, you know. And uh, sometimes I miss that. I miss that 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 time. I don't know if you if you know Enrique Muji. We we working on this together. He, he, he was there, and we man, that that guy is very funny. I love the guy. So we had a lot of moments there. Um, even though it was that we had to work to, to late at night. So as I see, you had been working in places that uh, I would say they are very demanding. And uh, you somehow get used to it and you saw that not as a challenge anymore, but as a way of work. And once you move it to different companies, somehow things was, you know, way easier, way smooth way interesting for you because you start to have more time to figure out and think about things instead of keep always pushing yourself to the edge. Uh, uh, my understanding is correct? Yes, uh, but uh, I guess the challenges uh, from these newer companies, like the, the bigger they get, is the soft skills. So my challenges wasn't the hard skills anymore. It was the sauce. And then, and then this, well, I had big issues with the sauce. Because, man, uh, also, I, I had to mention something that very interesting. Uh, I just found out, like, like a year and a half ago, kind of, uh, when I was doing my. my my analysis with a professional, and I just found out that I have TD, you know, PTSD. So PTSD is a condition that uh, makes you very angry sometimes, uh, and you have no control of your temper. 
uh, alongside with all the issues that, that people obviously really know about. So I had a lot of trouble with people, especially managers, because uh, I had a lot of managers that didn't knew a single thing about the development and all this stuff. And I was constantly getting mad at them, and, and I, I asked, uh, I left a lot of companies because of my leadership. So I decided I'm going to be a leader, and I, I'm never going to lose uh, personnel from my team because of me. I'm, not, I'm never going to be the reason why people is going to, to leave the company. So that is my own one. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. You had done a very tough decision because there's a lot of things out there that are not under our control. And uh, somehow you move into a more pragmatic direction where you would, you know, make things right when you can. And that is something very difficult. And uh, I think you choose the right path. I hope so. John, as I get to know, listen from you, I noticed that you get to know really a lot of interesting and outstanding people. This leads me to ask you, uh, who has been the most influential person in your life and uh, in what way? Well, man, uh, that, to, that question is very interesting because I had a lot of people. I guess that, that was like, uh, there were stages. I was stuck somewhere and then someone came and told me something that changed my way to do things. Uh, I think I to, to tell you that the first person that told me something that changed my way to do things uh, was, uh, f first of all, Muji. I think Muji has shaped it a lot things in me, especially technical things. Uh, and he told me that I, I helped him with uh, the soft skills, but I don't understand why, because I was very bad with that. But uh, he told me that I, I, I have a good uh, way of convincing people of things. And, and, and he learned from me that, and I learned from him that uh, some, uh, a lot of technical uh, lessons. So he was my first guide into the technical world. Um, there was Claudio from, from another experience, a guy that uh, uh, taught me how to be resilient. He was very resilient, so I looked forward to learn everything. And after him, I must say that you, you made us here. Uh, told me something that I tell people until this day. <laughs> you told me, guys, uh, we, IT workers, programmers, whatever, we are the only people that has the knowledge about the entire process. And we work on several companies that has all the kind of business uh, and we, we know it all. So, if things is going to change, it's going to start here in IT. The IT guys that work on systems that know all the kind of processes and businesses, we are the guys that are going to, to make the company change, that's going to bring change. We, we are the tip of the iceberg. So, from that day on, I started to see my work and my how my influence could be strong. Uh, and even though when I didn't have much maturity to, to, to make this, what you say, to me happen, but today I see it. Today I have the, the, I have the, the, the soft skills needed to do that, and I do it. I, I, because I, I am aware that I'm the guy that works on civil systems and civil companies that have been in, in very, on all the kinds of uh, situations and now I, everything I see is like, a, oh, this problem again, 
I, I've solved this problem before, and they couldn't stop it again. <laughs> and, and people, and, you know, uh, business people sometimes have no idea what they want, what they are doing, and, and, and we cannot be rude to people, but I know that, man, this is what uh, this guy is liking. This is little. So, I today I do some provocations. I speak softly, and but I know that it's our influences that's going to bring changes. So, uh, uh, I tell that to every programmer that I coach. I tell that to everyone that I work with. I say, man, this is true. You, you, you have this inside of you. <laughs> you're going to do it. So that's, you, you taught me this first lesson. And then uh, after that, I met a lot of managers in my life. Uh, in the latest one, it's called, he's called Toto Aldo. And he's a, he was on the same company for 32 years. He started as a, as a, a man on the, uh, th this, this place is a, is a manufacturing place. So he started as a, as a, as a line worker. Then he studied, he, he got to the IT. He was a programmer. Then he, he, was, then he was the manager of IT of the entire factory. And uh, he noticed that I, I, I used to have a short temper. And then he said, man, you are very talented, you are very skilled, but you cannot lose your temper. And then he said to me, every meeting that people is going to call you, you have to call me. On every meeting you go, you have to call me. Then I did that. And uh, every time that I was losing my temper, he, he said, whoa, 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 whoa. So, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, and then I knew it, that was his sign telling me, man, you are losing your temper. <laughs> you must come up. Uh, and then this was very, very important to me. Because that's, that was the line, man, that I, I must watch myself. I must see when this is, is coming. I must control. That's my problem. That's my main issue. So my career don't go forward because of this. Uh, and from this point forward, I just grew. Yeah. And I, now I go where I am, and I guess that I'm, I'm, I, I, I have so good relationship with my boss now that I'm going to, to get promotions very faster. Than that. So that's the lesson for me. Um, and the people that influence me, yeah. it's good to be here sharing this with you because you, you were very influential for me on that point. Well, I thank you for your, your sharing, John. Uh, it's, it's very good and important I also listen from you because uh, there are a lot of things that uh, I believe that who is listening to us is reminding and is noticing right now and uh, the same about me. Uh, I understand that self-control is something that really takes time to get it right and to do it well. And uh, I understand that most of the time uh, we are evaluated by other persons by the way you behave, not actually by all of the deliveries or all of the good work that you are capable to do or even all of your expertise. And uh, that's all about people wear. So it's really nice to hear that from you. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> and uh, what's the most valuable lesson you've learned in your career? Yeah, the, yeah, we talked about this lesson that you gave me. <laughs> was very important. Uh, the other one, I guess, uh, um, I guess if we are talking about, about IT, I, I guess the most important lesson is that 
that we cannot follow the law with her solutions, uh, neither with her code, and neither with her knowledge, because we will never have that knowledge. Uh, we think we are smart, we think we have all the knowledge, but that's, that's, that's always about a solution for someone with a nice idea, and we have to listen to other people. Every time, even the junior programmers that may have a better solution than we have right now, uh, and uh, it's important to know that uh, even though we know uh, design pattern, we know architecture, we know good good coding skills, we have team uh, team code team architecture team everything, solids, all of that. Well, all of that doesn't matter uh, because at the end of the day, we have to deliver a system to business. Sometimes we, we, we forget that we are on a business, not on a like, tech factor where we're working with a huge name technology thing. We are doing something to deliver experience for a, for a customer and for that business strive and, and grow and it doesn't matter how you deliver them you have to deliver something so the business grow so sometimes we ah we we need uh, quality we need uh, uh, solar and all this stuff is important and the tech parts and everything is important but we sometimes we get out of hand because we're going to, to uh, apply something very uh, scalable software and everything, and then we understand that the business didn't need all of that. Uh, it needed uh, like a, something very simple. So, as you just said, this reminds me of something very important that is about decide as late as possible, which I learned from you. And uh, sometimes you are building a system that needs to be scalable, needs to be fast, needs to be resilient, and uh, maybe it's not just the time for that. Maybe you don't even have enough customers for it. I mean, this is something very important. And uh, I note that whatever is the technique or the knowledge that you are applying, which it will help you, that's for sure, it does not mean that is going to bring value to the product or to what you are building, not only because of the time to market, but also because there are times that you, what you're just doing is just not needed yet. For sure. So, yeah, th there's uh, this that uh, I've learned recently uh, uh, with Joe by the kitchen. <laughs> because uh, I wasn't taking the TDD approach the right way and then I studied and I, I now I see how TDD is something uh, something uh, that is the next thing is the, the next level is something that disrupt because it, it, it's uh, it says man create a test then create the code and then this code that we're going to do do it do it, just do it best, just, just do it work, then we have factor. Because this first code that you're going to do is not going to be the best code, but it's going to be the code that already delivers the value. And then if we need this code to be faster, then you're going to refactor it later. Maybe this first delivery is already there, it, it does, it already does what we need. Uh, do you remember in the past that we, we, we used a metric called crack? I don't know if you, if you work it with this. Yes, I remember about the message system. You know, the, the, crack, the crack metric it was about... Uh, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't hear you well. Yes, the crack metrics. Yes, I remember when we used that and uh, along with other metrics, including uh, cyclomatic complexity and also if uh, we had redundant code. Yeah, so the correct method was uh, the method 
with the most symptomatic complexity that wasn't covered by tests. So that was the, the higher risk method of our application. So maybe that's the first method that we, you will want to refactor or test because uh, it's a high risk to have a, a complex code that isn't tested. So if you start up with the test first, this code's not, even if it's not a good code, it's not to be a big risk because it's tested, you know? So mm -hmm. that's uh, where TDD uh, shines and brings us to this side as late as possible because your first approach is going to be clean approach. And you see that this, this, this method, it, it's included, it includes junior and, and, and senior developer because the junior is going to be do its, uh, its crack code because he's a junior, but it doesn't matter because the code is tested and, and, and the code is, is, is not risky, you know? And then the way we have to test on TDD, we, uh, we approach that the unity is not a class, the unity is not a method, the unity is the feature. So you are going to do a test about the feature and not going to couple that test to your code. Uh, so that way, uh, you don't have a test that uh, is going to be coupled. So if you change it, if you refactor, uh, you don't need to refactor the test. You're going to refactor on the code because the code, the test is not tied to, to the implementation. Uh, and we used to do that a lot in the past to do uh, testing code that was very, very tied to the, to the implementation. And that's a problem. So TDD says, no, don't do that. Do a test uh, about your business group. Test the business group, not the code, not the implementation. And in, in that brings safety to your test. Your test is safe because it's testing the feature. And you can refactor and redo your code wherever you like, uh, and the test is going to be uh, working. It's going to be a certain that whenever implementation you came up with uh, is going to, uh, to, to achieve that uh, business goal of the feature that you are, you are developing. So uh, that's very, that's, the, I guess every programmer today has to, to get to that lesson uh, and, 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 and step out of his pedestal and see, man, we got to do things uh, this way because it's more, it's more human, it's more humble, and it's, it's, it's less uh, risky, you know. Yes, I, I like very much what you say, and it's something interesting as well, because you are mentioning about test the business, which is totally true. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the new generation of engineers because uh, there are times that I see a lot of buzz and stuff just about TDD and it does not seem that uh, we are somehow helping the new engineers to understand better about that. So in my view, the test drive development is a very interesting tool, however, it's a tool for design in my view because is helping you to increase the abstraction of your code and at the same time is giving you the math proof that this is doing what you ask it to do is behaving as expected and for me it's very hard to understand how you are going to build a scalable or even a stable solution without use such tools that are here available for quite a long time and uh, this lack of quality sometimes concerns me because I have been seeing people criticize him. I think they may not know much about test drive development. And uh, on the other hand, it seems that those persons are quite comfortable to do something in a short time, which is okay. However, take days, maybe weeks in order to fix that or do it in the proper way, which doesn't make much sense in my mind. I mean, you just found a way to take longer to deliver value to business. Let me see if I understood your point. 
okay, if you if you don't test your application, you are going to get into the cycle of uh, uh, getting bugs, uh, and the feedback of that is going to be uh, going to your product, your code, some production. Yes, right. and I think this is a very big challenge for you as an architect because better than anyone, you understand, we cannot scale crap code, right? Well, it depends, man. It depends. There, there are crap code that runs faster than good, <laughs> good crafted code. <laughs> Sometimes uh, the crap code is, is the fastest one. Uh, that's, that's abstract. You know, uh, if you imagine if we if we started to to develop uh, with AI, for example, and only the AI is going to to manage the code. You see, the AI is not going to need abstractions anymore. The AI can can do uh, procedural code if, if 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 it will, because who's going to manage the code is the AI itself. The AI can do like the most shit code ever uh, because it's, it won't matter anymore because we, we create abstractions and good readable code because we don't create this good code uh, for the company or for the software to scale. Mm. We create this good code for so, so our co workers can understand the code and, and, and do uh, maintenance of the, of the code. Uh, I can do a procedural code uh, that scales, that runs fast, but no one's going to understand it. So what's the, what's the, problem, the, the point? Uh, and like uh, some guys say, ah, Python is slow. Uh, don't use Python because Python is slow. The problem is not the Python being slow. The, the problem is that Python is easy to understand. Python is... is uh, you can have uh, 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 you can have junior programmers uh, coding very complex things. You know, with you are Python. talking about the readability, right, of the code. How friendly to other developers and engineers your code is. I mean, in a way that you're not writing down things for machines or even obfuscating and making way harder to understand what is is doing there. Yeah, so the problem is not uh, the code have to be fast. Uh, sometimes uh, we ask to, to business people, so how much time do you think that uh, if we have like eventual uh, consistency of application that uh, there are uh, some uh, dashboards that's going to be updated uh, like uh, in a minute or five minutes later, Usually, when you ask these people, well, how much time do you think that uh, is acceptable for this dashboard to be outdated? Usually, they say, ah, like, uh, hours, days. And, and then, you know, well, we did all these microservices and all these scaling things, and you're telling me that uh, one hour is fine <laughs> for this data to be outdated? Uh, yeah, it's fine. One hour is fine. So sometimes I think, ah, why, am, uh, why am I using C++ here? I could use Python, and my code would be easier to understand because Python is very easier to understand. Uh, and uh, I would be saving, uh, avoiding a lot of bugs here because C++ code, uh, the thing is, is to have more bugs because it's a more complex language, you know? So, you see, sometimes we, uh, there was a time that I was on a, on a, on a IT conference and I saw this guy, Neil Ford, I, I don't know if you, if you know the guy, Ford Neil, Ford Neil. So, uh, he, he gave us a lecture about uh, distraction, distraction. And he said, we are stuck on our abstractions. And these abstractions uh, is distracting us from the real thing that we have to do here, you know. So sometimes, uh, ah, I have to do solid, uh, single responsibility, you know. And this 
is, is sometimes it's, it's getting us distracted from the real goal that we have. So after I read this book, uh, it's called The Goal. Uh, the Goal from... Uh, and then, interesting enough, this is something that you told me, this, this company. Yeah. But what's the goal of a company? Uh, it's to get money, it's to solve some problem. Maybe get money by solving some problem. But the, the thing is that the people forgot the goal. And now everyone is working on its own behalf. Like I, I want to create a, 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 a code, a scalable code with microservices and all this architecture because I want to put that on my resume. You know, uh, I'm not working for the goal. I'm working for myself. You know, and the company also doesn't know the goal. The, the POs are asking us to do some features that they. I don't even know if the customer wants that feature. All he wants is to put the feature uh, on the system and say to the boss, look, oh, it's a good feature that I came up with. You know, and, and everyone is working uh, for their own glory and they forgot. Uh, they have a product on, on their hands that is going to change. The, sometimes it's a disruptive product that's going to change the way we think about things like uh, Facebook that changed the world and, and all that stuff, but uh, we don't have the goal of delivering something to our customers. We sometimes have the goal of doing something that is going to make uh, look better on our resume. That's important too, but uh, the company needs to have your goal. I, I guess the, the company itself is not telling us that they go anymore. They they just don't know what they where they are going to. Uh, like uh, there are companies that uh, that all they care about is, is is about how how much they pay per work from the on the balance, you know. Uh, and, and then uh, we are doing this new stuff and all this just to 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 the people who, who puts money there. To, ah, this company is going in the right way, but. Uh, then we, as customers, we say, well, this, this service is crappy, this service, this, I, I hate this company, you know, but this is the only company that gives me this, uh, and I have to stick with them because I cannot get these products from anywhere else. Uh, sometimes we do, but the other companies doing the same crap and, and nothing is, is getting better. Because we are, uh, we are kind of locked in this feature factor, you know. We got yes, uh, actually, we don't know uh, what are the constraints that uh, each one of these companies have. Uh, we understand that a uh, few of them are serving very poorly the customers, and is one of the reasons they are losing customers. We can take example a company right now that just changed the CEO is a company who sells coffee. And uh, there's a, a bubble, there's, you know, a kind of hype now about the new CEO because there's a lot of things that they are actually fighting against for, but not for the CEO. The CEO pretty much have it all. We're talking about commuting, we're talking about work from home, we're talking about a lot of very interesting perks that uh, the workers are asking for and they do not grant them with it. And uh, I think that is the point when you stop delighting your customers you stop bringing value to them, and uh, maybe you just bring value to the shareholders. The point is that the shareholders can just move in or move out anytime, different than a customer, different than an employee. So, I don't know, I think that those companies are making very strange and dangerous decisions. Anyway, I don't know the things those guys know to do what they are doing now. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the whole thing, I guess, the um, address yeah, is quite right in this book, when uh, it's a, a book when that's, it's a romance book, but it's a romance book with uh, a methodology inside of it, because it tells the story of this uh, big manufacturing manager that he is on the, his factory and says, why are our productions so low when 
every every uh, part of the company, every step of the production is is is, is optimized at its maximum. And every uh, every step is uh, on its uh, maximum optimization. So the young sales. When we have a constraint, we gotta work with that constraint. Because if, if some part, even if that part is really, really, uh, uh, it, it's uh, very optimized, maybe it's this lower part of the process. And if the part that comes before that, the steps that comes before this slow step, is doing, is doing things very faster, is going to only to create some kind of backlog for this slow constraint, you know? And that yeah. way, uh, it's better for you to focus on the constraint and, 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 and make the factory work on the speed of this constraint so you can waste material and, and all these things. And I, I, I don't know if you, if you read the book, but uh, sometimes it, you told me things that goes on the idea of, uh, of waste because we, we are not uh, taking care of the, the constraint, you know. So, uh, I guess what I try to say is that uh, even when we are designing some software, we got to understand that even if it's very scalable, if the slowest part of the software uh, is slow, everything is going to be slow. So maybe that's that being slow is part of the business because maybe the solution is impossible to get faster. Uh -huh. um, and it doesn't matter if everything around it is very fast. Your software has to work on the constraints. And that's yes. important for you to notice. Yes, and this led me for very uh, actually actually scary things for me. And I would like to know a bit more what you think over it. We have software everywhere today, which is actually good, right? But there are some softwares that they have, I would say, quality problems, because I would to address this in a very broader way. So. One of the softwares that have a problem, and I believe it was already fixed, was a software from a company that works with aviation. So the airplane itself have an autopilot, and the autopilot have a software in it that unfortunately was, I would say, buggy. It has quality problems. And on the other hand, we have something that happened recently that we have pretty much a blackout in the whole world once a software was deployed with an error, with a mistake. I'm talking about the crowdsourcing, crowd, sorry, I'm talking about CrowdStrike and Microsoft and also Boeing. What you think about those things happening for such critical systems? Yeah, man, I guess shit happens. <laughs> We have to get that. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what I think about it is that it's unavoidable. You know, why? Because we human beings, we we are working with complexities that uh, our our minds our minds are in good for. Uh, I mean, uh, we as society, we. We evolved technology so fast, and our minds uh, are not able to, to cope with that. You know, it's something so complex, and, and it evolves like three companies. You know, three companies with different people take different uh, decisions, and and you know, Microsoft is taking care of uh, of entire OS and Windows, which Windows, uh, I, I guess that the, the code base for Windows maybe. <laughs> I, I I'm sure that's very messy right there. That there may be some new parts of the kernel that that's better. 
but they they don't have like a, a lean store goes there to, to help them. Like <laughs> uh, I guess a lean store goes is a unique person that man I guess Linux is going to get very buggy after he he passed away, you know. <laughs> There's no one to, to, to replace the guy. Uh, and and CrowdStrike also something about security and all this stuff is very complex. And so how could this be? this uh, just Microsoft and CrowdStrike? How how could they have this this vision of everything? Beforehand, uh, we, we are talking about some very complex software. Very complex. And it's very. I, I don't know if they do not know. The personal system. What? And uh, they are very tied to the core of the operational system. Yeah, because uh, the firewall has to be on the on the base on the kernel on the, on the base level of, of the system. And there are very much complexities, like, uh, I don't know, anything that Microsoft could commit a new code that, that without telling CrowdStrike and EV, or even uh, a solving engineer uh, decided to do something that anyone else was aware of. And he took this decision by himself. Uh, on the, he was feeling like I'm a rebel, I'm going to commit that, you know. So how to control that? I guess we, we what what we have to, to do is, is is know that we are going to fail. We have to know we are going to fail. That's a reality. We are going to fail. So we have always to have plans to fail fast. I guess that's that's the thing. The agility is telling us a long time ago, fail fast. So I guess where these guys, uh, where things are going wrong is they don't have a plan to go back fast from, from this problem, you know. They, they took several days to, 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 to do a whole back or something. But if they have a plan, well, if, they, if this is going to, to go to hell, Really fast someday. We had to have a plan for that. They didn't, you know. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. So, as you said, there's a lot of complexity on it, which we do not comprehend, because, as you said, our systems and software they have been evolved since the early beginning. While we did not change much, we still people. And when you are talking about fail fast, something important come in mind because in the case of uh, the security software, fail fast makes sense, and uh, it can be done in house way before getting to production. That's way different than an embedded software, which is the case of the airplanes. However, once we are talking about the security software and fail fast, then it comes all the pipeline, including AI on the way, which is doing the job. It may not have the supervision of humans. It means you think we may be trusting too much too fast or not really? Trusting AI? In a general way, I, I am counting AI as a kind of automation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, man, I guess AI can't be trusted right now. The way it works, you know, AI relies on, on uh, it is a mathematical uh, model, it is based on. Uh, probabilities. It's a it's a system based on, on probabilities. It, it it tries to find patterns and say, yeah, oh, this pattern. Since I get this pattern a lot, so the answer for that other thing must be something like this pattern. So it, it, that's probability, and that's why the AI uh, misses a lot of things because probability is probability. It's not Right, it's not, ah, this is going to happen because 
No, this may happen. And the AI is, is based on this probability system all the way in the region. So uh, we, we cannot trust like this kind of thing that needs a lot of security to something that uh, is going to miss a lot because it's not uh, a predictable system, you know? So you think that for critical system, it's not the time yet for AI. But for other systems which are not critical, let's say like book a taxi, it won't be an issue, it's okay. Book a taxi, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know the software, but I guess something like Uber. Yeah. Because we, we usually don't want to get a ride with, uh, with someone that has no rating, and also that is a rating for the passenger. And the passenger, if he gets no rating, he also is off of the platform. But uh, there is this YouTuber uh, which had uh, a toy baby in his hand. And he was doing some kind of job and he dropped the toy baby uh, on, the, on the floor, you know. Then he got the toy baby in a way that, okay, it's a toy, it's not a child. But the AI thought it, that it was uh, a child. And the AI automatically burned him. And he, we are talking about a huge channel, a guy who had uh, thousands of followers. And he has a company. He, and everyone who works for him depends on this channel because it's the revenue of this, this company. And the, the AI just cut the guy off because he dropped a toy baby, you know. And then he went uh, to talk to, to YouTube and, and to get his channel back, he, he lost like a, a master month of his channel. So he lost a lot of revenue there because of uh, a mistake of AI. So, uh, AI is important, but I don't think that the AI could, uh, ha can do uh, this kind of, of, of decision without human supervision. Because, like in this case, the guy lost a lot of things. He lost money, he lost uh, people who, who depend on, on his channel, he was losing money, you know. So, AI took a, a, wrong, uh, a wrong decision. Another Another thing that uh, is recent is the Google Photos. You know Google Photos, uh, where when you, you can take pictures with your cell phone and you can uh, you can set this to send uh, to Google for, to the cloud automatically. You know, and there is this guy who took a photo of, of, the, of the penis of his baby to send to 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 to, to, to the baby to the baby doctor. To say, oh, there, there is a, there is something on my baby. I want, I want you to see this. Uh, what do you think this is? Uh, do I need to, to, to medicate? So when this, this picture got to Google Cloud, the AI thought that this was a, a child's picture, and then it blocked the cell phone of this guy, and all the, all his accounts. And, and caught the, the cops immediately. So the guy was the most arrested because a picture that he was sent to a doctor. Um, I, I guess AI shouldn't be taking this kind of responsibility by itself. I see. Uh, as we see, uh, it seems that uh, the biggest point, and of course, is very complex in here. Uh, because is uh, human centric is exactly the discerning, right? AIs are not capable of discerning things, and uh, right now we are just bringing things to them and say, figure out yourself, which they are doing, and uh, some of them are not having enough supervision from humans, from people to see, hey, you go in an okay direction or no? It's not like that. It's like this. So you see that. Uh, AI may help us 
more in things that we are numbers driven. And by that, I'm talking about softwares and system, even in real time, that collect a lot of data. We can talk about Formula One here. We can talk about uh, insurance companies. We can talk about banks. How you think about that? Well, what, what I think about that is that uh, AI can help us a lot with, with some cases like uh, the ones you said. Like uh, if we want to try to predict something, uh, maybe AI is going to help us to predict it. To try to predict it, something with in a more reliable way the human beings can do. For example, even for maybe for weather, uh, if we can, if we, we want to predict some uh, some catastrophic um, weather things, maybe the AI is going to help us. But uh, as a, I, I, I've seen uh, as a standard for, for the super companies, for example, uh, they are thinking that we we can take a, a, an AI and, and you know, we can can go to a small company with like 10 or 50 people and we, we just with AI we can turn that small company to a multi million company uh, in, like uh, in, in a small time, a small amount of time. Uh, so you mean that this small company with the help of AI and tools will be way more productive and uh, maybe, you know, will run more affordable operations as well? Yeah, they're counting with the idea that the, the AI can give these guys ideas of management and, and bring them the, the next big idea of uh, how to sell the products or how to grow the, the business, you know, because uh, uh, in theory, they think that the AI uh, is better than humans to, to come up with ideas. But uh, AI doesn't come up with ideas. AI, is, uh, AI gets up ideas and tell other people about the ideas. They, AI cannot create. AI can transform. It can take two ideas, mix that, and try to create something out of two ideas uh, to look alike ideas. And, and it can uh, be understood. So AI basically train and learn from from us. Let's say like that, right? Because people are the ones building, producing things, and information, and publishing them. So AI do not think about that or process that information. It pretty much just look by the numbers, which are the most probably the best answer for such question, and then provide that information to you, something like that, right? Yeah. So that's not going to, to, to make a business uh, the next big idea, because all we're going to do is get old ideas and, and present us on a better way. Uh, it's going to teach us things that we already have discovered. It will create new ideas and won't help us scale a business, at least on my opinion. It won't help us because, uh, because it, uh, it invents things. Uh, when you try to, to, to predict something, sometimes it gets a, a fake information and, 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 and mix that with a real information. It brings us some salad of uh, strange information. And for example, if you, I, I'm pretty sure if you get AI to, to in a case, in a criminal case against a real lawyer, you know, that lawyer is going to, to, to win. There's no way the AI can win from a good lawyer or can uh, bypass a good judge, you know, because humans are way better when it comes to abstraction or, or philosophy and all this stuff, because uh, AI cannot be a philosopher. Only humans can do that. For from my perspective, AI cannot uh, abstract the thoughts and come up with something. Okay, then is when comes the creation, right? Because you abstract something and from that compound of knowledge that you have, you have a derivative, something else, something new, because now 
you are using the knowledge you possess to bring up something else. And it's pretty much what we we happens with math, right? We learn the basic operations, and from that basic operations, we are able to abstract and see other possibilities by doing math. However, there's a thing that at least I heard is more about the copyrights. Since AI is learning from all of the data that we possess and there are copyrights, AI is pretty much not allowed to do that, right? So I heard something in the news that uh, there are people claiming and asking for whoever has copyrights to just give up his copyrights, let it be, and allow AI to use it in a way that everything will be pretty much public domain. Did you hear something about it? What do you think? Well, I think that uh, AI tools uh, has to pay the royalties for these people. Like Spotify, for example, has to pay royalties for every time it plays a song that's from an artist, even though they play just, they pay just uh, small amounts. They have to do it. Uh, I guess if AI is going to get ideas from some book or from some power, it has, every time it uses this information, it has to pay something to that power. Because, you know, I think that this, this is the best way because AI is not going to create things, at least not for now. Okay? So the humans is going to create and feed AI. And they have to be paid for that, I think. <laughs> All right, I got it, I got it. So I see that a lot of things that we have been expecting, maybe even being afraid of, they are pretty much just buzz from the news. And they're not going to happen just now. Because as we see, there are things that AI cannot clearly do. And one of them is about the copyrights. Another thing is that this is a very expensive game. So the small companies are out of it. It's only for the big players. And uh, we are developing, evolving something that we are not so sure about the value that is bringing back. And I think that you that is listening to us could see this on the news already. And uh, we have a very, and we have bad quarter results showing that AI is not bringing what it was proposed to. So John, uh, a last thing that I would like to ask you, what advice would you give to the younger generation? I guess the, 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 the whole time we're talking here is, is good advice for them. Like, we're talking about soft skills here. So we are talking about uh, being humble because this new generation seems to not be humble. They, uh, they got a, a world where they they have everything on their hands, like they want to ride a, a cat, click a book on everything is so easy for them. And even uh, learning things, they can open YouTube you know, and watch a lot of videos and learn very fast. Uh, they have the, the AI itself is going to teach them a lot of things faster than we could in the past. But maybe the advice is uh, be humble, learn all that. Because today the, the, the competition is going to be higher because everyone is, is, is going to have access to information and everything. So everyone's going to be as good as you are, uh, even better. There will be more and more people knowing things because the tools today is going to make, make it so easy to, to, to learn and understand. Mm -hmm. And so if the things that we are going to need most, the most on this new world is, is, is the soft skills, is the compassion, is the way you, you talk to people, uh, your charisma, your personality, uh, the way you, you treat people, the way you, you talk. Uh, I guess the meetings is going to be longer in, in the future. Because people will have more time to chat, more time to think, more time to elaborate. If they're going to have the AI, for example, for the basic things, and they they are going to be thinking about more complex stuff because the, the basic is going to be covered. 
uh, and they have longer meetings, and so people really is, is going to be talking to each other more. So I guess the relationships between people is going to be more important because everything is going to be a robot, uh, a chatbot or something cold. And then if we want to do something great in the future, maybe it's going to be something that has humanity in it. So I guess the future, uh, I guess it's going to be a challenge for you to not be a robot in the future. If, you're, if you manage to be a human being in the future, maybe that's when you, you are going to, to be something else. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I, I'm talking something too much abstract, but uh, I think that that's the, what I'm feeling right now. Okay, John. I'm afraid that we are coming to the end of this episode. I would like to thank you very much for being here with us today. It's uh, really good to listen and also learn from someone like you that is very seasoned, have a lot of experience and passed through a lot of things. I'm very thankful for that. And uh, I would like to know if you have a final thoughts. Okay. So, uh, I'm grateful for you to call me for, for this. Uh, I'm happy to share my, my, my thoughts with you. Uh, I'm planning to do content for a long time. I really didn't do it. I don't know why. I, I don't have the will to start. <laughs> but I really wanted to start. And I guess this is my, my, first, my first step this journey that I'm going to do for a long time. So right now I'm going to, to start to do some companies. So uh, I would like to, to say to people who are listening to us right now to stay tuned on the team that maybe I am coming with more content uh, uh, that I've been planning for a long time. I have some some material that I have text and I think I could to read it. If this episode here is good, maybe my content will be good also be good. And I'm available for 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 anything that people may want uh, to like architectural designs and I I'm open to the kind of uh, half half-time work because I have my, my main work but I do a lot of half-time work and I am available to anyone who wants that kind of perspectives uh, I, I, I can work as a consultant but I can also uh, do codes for anyone who's, who's needing it but I guess my expertise is more important to, to know if you your business has the best design uh, or um, is going in the right direction if you are developing it. So if you want to reach me, reach me out through LinkedIn and from there I can give you more uh, channels for you to, to talk to reach me. Um, and that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed as I did and please Contact me if you need anything. Stay tuned for more content. <laughs>